Tejasvinavaditamastu ma vidvishavahai Om Shanti 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 Ariyom Tatsat Om May the Divine Being look over us lovingly as a mother and father. May the Divine Being support and nourish us as a mother and father. May we have the strength and skill to study together the art of spirituality. May no misunderstandings arise amongst us. Om peace, peace. Peace and beneficence be unto us and to all beloved beings everywhere. Oh, dearly beloved, make it so. So good morning, everyone. Good morning on this Sunday morning, right at the end of November. This morning, of course, what we're doing is having a little definition of bhakti according to Sri Ramakrishna and a, a word from Lord Jesus as well. And then we're it's open to discussion about the path of bhakti, the path of devotion. Now, I'm not going to read our usual uh, definition of bhakti, the one that comes with the newsletter and so on. I'm going to read what Sri Ramakrishna said. This is from uh, the portrait of Sri Ramakrishna, uh, Punta Punti, written by Akshay Kumar Sen. Sri Ramakrishna's definition of bhakti. The path of knowledge involves discrimination, renunciation, and judgmental analysis in order to destroy the ego. The seeker says that it is very difficult to follow in the Kali Yuga, to attain the knowledge of Brahman and be absorbed in Samadhi, the path of devotion, as enunciated by Narada, is the widest avenue in this age. I'll repeat that. To attain the knowledge of Brahman and be absorbed in Samadhi, the path of devotion, as enunciated by Narada, is the widest avenue in this age. Service, devotion, worship, and prayer, these are the marks of devotion as expounded by Narada. <clears throat> Constant prayer with a pure heart is the means of fulfilling one's desire through the mother's grace. It is the same goal to which the followers of the path of knowledge are roaming about, hoping to succeed. But before their desires are fulfilled, their lives come to an end. But the loving mother prefers devotion. The devotees are like children to her. A devotee hardly bothers about the knowledge of Brahman. He wants a vision of the mother, and for this he prays to the mother herself. If anyone elevates himself to the high level of samadhi, then the mother herself brings the person down. She points, no, she permits, she permits one to attain a semblance Ah, she permits one to attain a semblance of ego in one's heart, but such ego is not an unripe one. It is a matured ego. The matured ego is like a rope which is burnt. 
the jivas. Ah, I'm sorry. The matured ego is like a rope which binds the jivas in a dangerous manner. When, whereas the matured ego is like a burnt rope, which has burned to ashes. It has only the appearance. It has no strength to bind. As I said, that's from the portrait of Sri Ramakrishna, the Punti. Um, and there's, if you want the page number, it'll be in the notes online. And this, just to let you know, <clears throat> that this idea is not uh, unique to our tradition of Vedanta. Listen to what Jesus said in the book of Matthew. My burden is light. Come to me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. Come to me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. I will show you the truth and the truth shall make you free. That's from the book of Matthew. <clears throat> so having read those things, I just like to say that I, I can't imagine a more clear definition of the bhakta's path than what this what Sri Ramakrishna said as quoted by Akshay in the Punti. It's very clear, it's very direct, and if you wish to review it, uh, we can review it at the end if you like, but it will be in the notes that are posted with this open forum uh, on the website and on our Facebook page. Uh, I mean, on our YouTube channel. So uh, that'll, you know, that'll be up by probably Wednesday. So you can fully review this as, as pleases yourself. <coughs> When Sri Ramakrishna says the bhakta's path, as defined by Narada, is the widest avenue in this age, of course, the reason he uses the word widest is he was fully aware of the Christian uh, uh, formulation that says straight is the way and narrow is the gate that leadeth unto salvation. So Sri Ramakrishna says this bhakta's path is the widest ever. And that's why I read something from Jesus Christ um, <clears throat> because he also says really what you have to do, forget about the straight path and the narrow gate just come to me, come to me, and I will make everything right. <clears throat> I will give you rest. So with that, are there any comments or questions, any concerns that any of this raises for you? Uh, and please do comment from your own wisdom and experience. This is the way we study the art of spirituality together. We, we share one another's uh, understanding, uh, which is uh, clearly from the one as represented by the many that appear on this wonderful morning screen. Anything from anyone? How does devotion live in your life? How does, how does it work for you to be devoted?
Are there people speaking and I'm not hearing? I know everybody's cats got their tongues. <laughs> <laughs> I was in the kitchen. Um, I'm not sure I have anything really to say yet, but um, I can't. Well, how does devotion work for you, Cindy? How does how does this okay. being devoted and faithful uh, work in your life? Well, mostly how it works for my life these days is I am devoted to practicing patience and kindness with myself and all beings that I come in contact with, including ones that I, uh, on one level, abhor, um, but I practice with them too as much as I can. I just start my day with that and um, I am, I, I think I mentioned this last week, I, I allow my uh, formation of the divine uh, be fluid because I believe that the forms are just forms like we're forms and we're fluid if we allow ourselves to be as well. And so sometimes um, a lot of times it may take a form and, but I'm not devoted to the form. I'm mm -hmm. devoted to the love and the, you know, this morning I was just sitting and, and thinking about how my, my favorite thing in the whole world about being a human being, and it has been so since I was quite young, is just those times when I can be still and quiet and the world around me is quiet enough and just being, just being with it, with everything that my being is able to apprehend, if that makes any sense. It but, certainly does. So, so, and I'm devoted to encouraging that, I guess for myself and other people. Wonderful. But that, you know, that is not devoted to a single thing. So is that, that I can say necessarily. Well, yes, as, as Hafiz remarked, if we're devoted to a single thing and we are insistent and dogmatic about that, all we're doing is worshiping a tiny God rather than the infinite and as you said, fluid being water still or water in waves same water form without form same being anything else from anyone brother shankar i will say good morning good morning uh, hi mark so good to hear from you my devotion and faith towards higher power makes me move forward by believing in footprints footprints Jesus Christ's footprints, you know, I always believed when I can't walk, he always carried me and carries me still. When I am able to walk, he walks with me. That's my belief. That continues to give me so much strength to move forward with by developing equanimity, forbearance, and all the other qualities. Even Cindy explained, that's my devotion. Beautiful. And it, that, uh, that conviction comes with the experience of actually feeling it, actually seeing it. I know this from conversations with you, that this is not something that you first read it on the page, of course, and it intrigued you. And so you uh, sought that experience and uh, found, yes, when I can't, uh, walk when i can't go forward on my own the divine carries me forward later and, on it manifested into meditation <clears throat> you know it took me into meditation deeper and deeper and now i'm very settled in the meditation and pranayama and all those <clears throat> and i continue to move that path with the devotion excellent thank you brother Shankar. well thank you dear as always for sharing yourself Mother, I feel that. Uh, oh. Sorry, somebody was saying something. No, go ahead. 
I feel that sometimes devotion invades you rather than you being devoted to something. Um, like sometimes I felt that, you know, I, I I watched like a simple like a two minute videos and it so took me over that I kept on listening to it the whole day and then for three or four days I was in like a a very different sort of mood. You know, it's it's almost that it invades you rather than you being devoted to it. Oh, very well said. This is what Jesus meant when he said, ye have not chosen me, I have chosen you. Uh, and uh, so it reaches out to us. Yes, it reaches out to us and touches us. And, and if we're open and receptive to it, then as you say, it takes you over. It, uh, it overwhelms your ordinary consciousness, your ordinary awareness and be in, it becomes something else for a period of time. But as Sri Ramakrishna said, even the most expert singer cannot keep her voice always on the highest note. So we return to our ordinary consciousness, but we are transformed by the experience. <clears throat> and so this is where that conviction comes from that Haimo was speaking about. We're transformed, and then that leads to deeper spiritual practice. Thank you, Rajiv. Anything else? Uh, there is, a, I mean, there's a, it's almost inevitable when somebody has an experience, a community of people, they want to categorize it. And so I feel like this entire business about bhakti and jnana and all of that, like bhakti, it's been categorized and everybody thinks that, yeah, bhakti means you need to have an idol and you need to have weep and you need to do all those things. But I mean, <laughs> who in this world is not devoted to something? And well, that's, the, that's, oh, how well said, Raji. This is what Yagnir Valkya meant when he, in the Brihadranya, Brihadranya Upanishad in that talk that he gives, he said it is not for the sake of the thing that we, or the person or the thing, that we are devoted to it. And we are devoted to things other than spiritual, so-called spiritual things. Uh, just just uh, back into somebody's Ferrari and you'll see how devoted they are to that automobile but Yagnir Valkya says it is not for the sake of the automobile, though they may think it is, it is for the sake of the self that is manifest as that automobile. There is only the self and it manifests in all of these many forms. So as you said, everyone is devoted to something. Everyone is a bhakta in one way or another. And as you write about the categorization, it's just for convenience. <clears throat> this is why, this is why uh, Vivekananda said, you know, practice one or more or all four of the yogas, and be free. Tom Carr, you had something. Yes, sir. Can you hear me? I certainly can. So the thing that I started thinking about when you were talking about a path that. I don't really feel like I'm on a path at this point. I I feel like uh, what I'm doing is living in the present, and and that's what's most liberating and freeing and happy for me. Is uh, one of the happiest states is is when I have this feeling like the present is all there is, and I'm in it. Or it's hard to put it into words, but I think of something Meher Baba said. Uh, I, I heard this years ago. He, wait, I, I've got the exact quote here. Le, Mayor Baba said, live more and more in the present, which is ever beautiful and stretches far away beyond the limits of the past and the future. And when I first heard that, I thought, well, that not, doesn't seem right. You know, the past is so big <laughs> and the future is so big. How can he say that that the present stretches far beyond the limits of the past and the future. But now it seems obviously true, you know, that all I ever have is, is the, this present moment and the past and the future are just sort of like thoughts that I have. Ah, precisely. And, and that in the present, there's no problems or there's very rarely a problem. There could be a problem with intense physical pain in the present. 
but generally there's no problems in the present. Most of my, pro almost all of my problems are just sort of like mental patterns about the future. You know, some terrible thing is going to happen in the future. Well, it never really actually happens. Uh, I'm always just living in the present. And when I get clear that I'm living in the present, it really is pretty beautiful or a wonder or wonderful, joyous, happy. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so, yeah, that's what that's what I experience. And that's what my but but path to me implies that I'm going somewhere. And I like the uh, the expression in. Uh, I don't know where this came from. I think Tibetan Buddhism, but they call it journey without goal. Yes. Uh, the, the, I don't know where I'm going, you know, and. Uh, <laughs> But I know being alive right now in this second can just be incredibly wonderful if I just pay attention. Uh, so so or also it can, it can be really bad if I get in a certain state of mind. Uh, and then I try to get out of that and get back into the joyous state. And so far as devotion goes, you know, I've always or for most of my adult life, I've been an agnostic. I, I just don't know. And I'm very happy not knowing. Uh, it feels it, it feels nice, you know, to just to have a sense of mystery. Like here I am. I don't know anything, you know. I don't know if there's a God or not. If there is a God, I don't know the nature of that God. Uh, but isn't it great just to be alive right now? And uh, and and from the from the point of view of someone observing you tom you seem indeed very devoted to your practice yeah yeah for, for the I'm reasons devoted. that you for the reasons that you mentioned i'm devoted to the practice because it makes me happy well that's it. <laughs> that's it that's exactly it happy and free that's what we're seeking yeah yeah and that's what i get when i you know i go through periods where i have great doubts about uh, meditation because I'm still I can still be pretty neurotic and selfish in spite of years of practice and I go through periods where I think why am I doing this but the fact is I do it because I like doing it there you go oh, and uh, if, if it, it if it wasn't satisfying why would we do it yeah yeah so anyway that's my two cents worth thanks for listening well, it certainly was a, a, a wonderful two cents worth. I'd say it was worth a good deal more than that. Thank you, as always, Tom, for sharing. Anything else from anyone in reaction to what Tom said or just in reaction to what was read earlier or anything else from your own wisdom or experience? Yeah, good morning, brother. Uh, Gaurav here. Yes, Gaurav. Uh, well, one of the things I have noticed is uh, no matter how much struggles I go through in my life, I all automatically, this is happening, uh, I automatically start taking uh, the mother's name, mm -hmm. okay, kind of reaching out to her. I mean, it, it just happens. I don't know why. Well, so I, I'm gravitating towards her quite a lot. Well, and yes. Go ahead. And uh, I, I, I have finished reading the wonderful book you had recommended, uh, Learning to Walk in the Dark. It's like phenomenal read. I think this is like, I don't know why the timing is, <laughs> what the timing is about. I'm gravitating towards mother. And then this talks about the darkness, which is part of uh, the Almighty too. And we got to accept it. And then there's this beautiful prayer at the end by Thomas Merton thoughts and solitude and I am looking at it every day it means I read it almost all the time every day and if you would permit me I can read that aloud yes, please do yes so it says my lord god I have no idea where I am going I do not see the road ahead of me I cannot know for certain where it will end nor do i really know myself and the fact that i think i am following your 
will does not mean that I am actually doing so. But I believe that the desire to please you does in fact please you. And I hope I have the desire, I, ha I, I hope I have that desire in all that I'm doing. I hope that I will never do anything apart from that desire. And I know that if I do this, you will lead me by the right road, though I may know nothing about it. Therefore, I'll trust you always through, always though I may seem to be lost in the shadow of death. I'll not fear, for you are ever with me. And you will never leave me to face my perils alone. Beautiful, beautiful. Well, for those of you who don't know, Thomas Merton is a, a very saintly uh, man who, who, for most of his life, was a Trappist monk. Uh, and uh, he, I often quote uh, from his. Uh, work also, and you heard recently uh, in one of the talks about the vision he had uh, at Fourth and Walnut Streets in Louisville, Kentucky, where he said he it, it became so apparent to him what a glory it is to be a human being. When I was speaking about the three graces, <clears throat> uh, and for those of you who don't know the book that uh, uh, Gorov mentioned. It is Barbara Brown Taylor, Barbara Brown Taylor. The book is Learning to Walk in the Dark. Uh, she is a magnificent writer and uh, a former Episcopalian priest who left the church and wrote a book about that called Leaving Church. <clears throat> then she wrote another book, uh, An Altar in the World, and then uh, this learning to walk in the dark. Uh, and then uh, she most recently published a fourth book called Holy Envy, Barbara Brown Taylor. Any of her books is worth your attention. Uh, she's a dear friend of this place, by the way. Uh, she lives nearby in, I think, Cartersville, Georgia. Thank you, Goro. Anything else from anyone? Yes, brother. Actually, this was this poem is exactly what Tom was talking about prior to this. And yes. Oh, yes. It's it is beautiful. It is, and of course, um, Thomas Burton spoke absolutely authentically from the heart. Uh, he whatever he wrote, and his his writings are highly treasured among spiritual seekers uh, so thank you would you, you like me to share the poem sir uh in the chat i have actually taken a picture of this i can yes it sir, it in share it in the chat and perhaps cindy can even <coughs> retrieve it and put it with the uh, put it with the notes for this talk and we'll hear an echo uh, here of, can you hear me now yes certainly. okay i have my but had to pull my mic down. Uh, I have a question. Yes, um, well, my background is Zen. Well, of course, my childhood is Baptist, but my background is Zen. And then about 10 years ago, I found uh, Advaita Vedanta, the, the more Vedanta, 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 yes. Vedanta the more uh, reformed <laughs> with uh, Rupert and Francis, and they don't really mention God too much, which has always been more comfortable to me because I was born into Baptist where God's you're you're sinful and he's a personality out there directing your life and anyway so and I I get this I love this need for devotion I love that you were talking about the mother to the, every other Sunday I do a I hold a meditation zoom and it's very small now but I have to do it as long as somebody wants to do it. But anyway, so I, I can come every other Sunday here. But uh, I loved what you were talking about, about the mother, uh, how she did everything with devotion. 
all the chores, feeding the cows in the barn and all that. And I love that. But I, I stumble over the word God, of course, and um, don't know how to <clears throat> pray to that and don't think I want to. And just wondered, like, and so I've been listening to some of the more traditional vid Vedanta, um, like uh, Swami Sarva Priyananda, mm -hmm. and they pray to God and stuff. And so what is the definition in Vedanta of God? Because I know all about the, you know, the undifferentiated consciousness and we're all one thing and in the ultimate, there's nothing going on. I get all that. But so I don't fit. I don't understand how the God thing fits in. Well, there are there are <laughs> three there are three definitions of God, if you will. And one is the one you've been speaking about. That is uh, the the unspoken and unknowable, and therefore you don't really concern yourself about it as a god and that is brahman the the undivided the the this is advaita vedanta non-dual undivided as swami yogeshananda the founder of this center used to say consciousness capital c consciousness is primary and is not plural and notice he didn't give it any name. This is the Advaita or non-dual aspect of God. Then there's the qualified non-dualism, which says the divine is a presence and I am a part of that presence. I am, my being is part of that divine being. Uh, so there's there's it's 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 one, but it appears to us to be a whole and then ourselves as a part. If you can imagine a a pie uh, out of which uh, a slice has been cut but not yet removed, so there's just that tiny division uh, between uh, the 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 rest of the pie, the whole and that little part, but you're still a part. So that's a, a visual metaphor for what is meant by qualified non-dualism. There is a whole of which you are inextricably and forever and infinitely a part. That's qualified non-dualism and that God uh, can have a, a form or a name uh, and, and does for the qualified non-dualists, usually Ishwara or Ishwari, uh, Ishwara the masculine form, Ishwari the, the feminine form, understanding that there's that really behind the appearance is genderlessness. So this is just for our convenience of thinking about it. Uh, so that's this is the way that's thought about. Then there is the dualistic point of view, the, the, the dualistic definition of God, which is the one that is most prevalent in Christianity. Under the, it, it may be a misunderstanding of God the Father as this uh, uh, old man with a beard on a throne uh, uh, judging us and uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, it looks to me like Christ was speaking of the, the nameless God because he said, I and my father are one. But he also said, I am the vine and ye are the branches. The vine is rooted in the, that oneness. That is the father of which he spoke. We have to always understand the context in which these avatars are speaking. Christ was speaking to a, an, an audience of Jews who had this, uh, really, that Old Testament God uh, of, uh, of hellfire and brimstone and 
fire and smoke and so on and so forth. And uh, Jesus said, I bring you a new covenant, a new way of being with the divine. So, but this is the dualistic way, seeing God as separate from yourself and you are not part of it. You are a servant or child of it. Uh, so those are the three definitions of God within Vedanta. Did all that make any sense, Kim? Yeah, I just wondered why um, um, why isn't it just taught from the highest, the, the first because, definition? Because we have different temperaments, dear. We have different levels of understanding. Yeah. I mean, Sarva Priyananda is not for everyone. Uh, everyone can can listen and wonder at him, but do they understand him? Are they going to live what he teaches? No, they are not. So this is why there are the four yogas as taught by Swami Vivekananda. The path of devotion, which we just are talking about this morning, the widest avenue, it is, the, as Vivekananda said, it is the slowest but the surest path. Then there's the path of action, of karma yoga, for those who live an active and are devoted to having an active life. How do you live? And I won't go into that because that's not our topic this morning, but it, it has its own workbook, which is basically the Bhagavad Gita. Uh, Krishna teaches karma yoga as a way of being. Uh, and then there is raja yoga, the, the yoga of psychic control. Uh, our mind is the main obstacle. It's our mind and its habits and its attractions and diversions are our main obstacle to realization. So uh, even jnanis, the advoitists, will tell you if you don't have the mental strength to live as a jnani, then practice meditation according to Patanjali or these, this psychic control until you gain control of your mind, then you can do this uh, rejection or destruction or annihilation of the mind, uh, which by Vashista, he says, just simply ignore it. Now, most people, most by far, particularly in this age, as Sri Ramakrishna pointed out, by far most people are not going to live that way. So they live one of the other three ways. And uh, this is why it isn't always taught. There is always the mention or gesture toward the highest. The ideal, as Swami Prabhavananda used to teach us very emphatically, the ideal must never be compromised. But we understand there are different ways to approach the ideal. So thanks for asking that very pregnant question. Thank you. You're welcome, dear. And I celebrate the fact that you're holding these uh, these sessions with those people, and may your may your uh, congregation grow. May your sangha grow. Brother, no, uh, I wanted to wind down. <laughs> I just said I wanted to wind down. I don't well, want to be as, a... uh, as, as, <laughs> as, ple as pleases your great and wonderful. <laughs> but as long as someone wants to be there, I'm there. <laughs> All right. But I don't well, want to be a teacher or a leader. <laughs> okay. Well, as pleases yourself, dear. And, <laughs> and you. uh, that that is a that's a wonderful. <clears throat> but mother's will be done because it's her universe after all. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Uh -huh. Goram, what did you? Were yes, you? yes. Um, um, I was actually. I'm. I'm. I'm reading uh, <coughs> Nisvarga Dutta Maharaj's teachings too on the side, and uh, at times it becomes extremely overwhelming. It's. I'm not the body. It's. It's not easy. It is. Well, <laughs> I, I, I kind of moved away from it for a little bit because I, I, I want to believe I know I have, I have God in me, but uh, 
I, 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 I gravitate towards the, the primordial uh, energy and the feminine aspect of it. So I guess it comes with what I prefer, I guess. Well, one, well so very well said as always, Goro. Nisargadatta Maharaj is certainly not for everyone. His book, I Am That, if you can really assimilate that book, you are doing great things. If we think about the 20th century, how many names stand out, stick up above all the rest as true Advoitans, as true Gyanis? There are only three, really, if you stop and think about it. That's Ramana Maharshi, Nisargadatta Maharaj, yes. and Swami Vivekananda. Those are the three. There are other names, but they're definitely lesser lights. And there are many direct path teachers of Advaita that if you look closely, they're not really living it. They may be teaching it, but they're not really living it. Uh, they say absurd things, and, uh, and you can tell that they're <clears throat> speaking, you know, as, as Goethe said, a man sees in the world what he carries in his heart. <clears throat> Forgive the masculine pronoun, that's the way Goethe wrote. Uh, a, a person sees in the world what they carry in their heart. So uh, these people, they say these absurd things, and you can say, you can see they're, they're not a, a, a Nisargadatta or a Ramana Maharshi or a Vivekananda. Thank you, Guru. Yeah. Amadas. Yes, Shankara. I um, wanted to share that my current um, favorite form of devotion is being in the arms of Mother Nature. Aha. And I started in September when I got back from being with my daughter and grandchildren for Labor Day. I started sleeping outside. We had not one night's of rain outside in September. And so uh, when the rain started in October, I set up a 10 by 10 canopy and, uh, and just kept sleeping outside. And so the, the sunrise and the sunset is very real to me. And I just spent, uh, very grateful to have spent the Thanksgiving weekend with my parents and the sunrise at, began for me about Montgomery. I just arrived minutes ago back on the farm and um, the colors in between are spectacular. And they just, they call out and uh, remind me of the cycle of life. Yes. which happens seasonally with mother nature. And, and I see her as God's, uh, God's creation. The, the manifestation of, of Brahma is right here in, in mother nature. And I've had the extra blessing of a week ago yesterday, uh, was able to host a, a sweat lodge of the uh, all nations tradition right here on the farm and have another one scheduled for Wednesday of uh, solstice. Uh, which is the uh, shortest day and longest night, uh, December 21st on Wednesday. So, and that to me is, uh, it's all devotion. It's, it's, it's going inside the lodge with the, the heat of the fire uh, transported by the, the stones is, uh, and it's four rounds of prayer. Just one prayer for self, prayer for family and friends, prayer for community, and then prayer for everybody I may have left out. And, uh, it's one of the purest forms of devotion that I know, and it happens right on Mother Earth with all of the elements of fire, wind, water, and heat. And uh, so that's how it's showing up for me currently, like as a waterfall uh, of color and, uh, and temperature and the whole texture of the experience of Mother Nature. And I uh, wanted to add that into the, to the conversation. And what a delicious conversation of devotion it is. And, and just one last thing. I seem to remember uh, Swami Vivekananda distilling bhakti yoga as the science of higher love. <laughs> well said. Yes, well remembered. Yes, it is the highest form of love that we're capable of. And it is, it, that's why we say it's said to be the heart centered path. Mm. Because all of love is, all of love, the infinity of love is reflected in our hearts. So thank you, Amadas. And of course, this 
finding the divine in nature. If you read the book, Love Poems from God, Love Poems from God by Daniel Ladinsky, every one of those 12 illumined souls that are reflected in that book uh, mentions this, especially Meister Eckhart. Mm -hmm. Meister Eckhart said, I, 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 in my youth, I, I knew this, it elevated me uh, to a very high state. Then I joined the church and began to do all of those things. And I lost it and I wept and I wept. And finally I returned to nature and she welcomed me and, uh, and restored me. Uh, so she, this is one of the ones. And of course, uh, from the uh, great Jewish uh, tradition of, of saints, uh, the Baal Shem Tov yes. uh, is also, uh, he also learned what he, the, the, the truth uh, from nature. His and first course, teacher was the forest. Yes, his first teacher was the forest. And then there's the Advahuta Gita, uh, in which uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the student has 26 teachers. Uh, all of them from nature. So this is this is a wide spread, and uh, of course we can learn when our vision is clear. We'll see the truth uh, of nature uh, for what it is, which is a reflection of the creativity of the divine spirit. Uh, John O'Donohue, by the way. And his book, Anamkara, rhapsodizes about this to some degree. <clears throat> Brother, uh, j just a recommendation, like uh, since Amadas talked about the nature stuff, I would recommend watching a documentary that's on Netflix. It's called Our Universe. It's been narrated by Morgan Freeman, just came out. Mm -hmm. It is exactly, it shows the astounding power of Divine Mother. And creating wow. everything. Oh my gosh! Means our how... universe. Our universe. Netflix, uh, narrated by Morgan Freeman. Thank you, Gora. It is astounding. I'll see if I can't uh, watch that. Anything else from anyone? Uh, brother, uh, the, whenever we talk about devotion, we feel that you know. So. I, there is this personal and then there is this universal. And I think mostly um, we generally talk about like personal God in devotion, but you know, I was actually contemplating on this and I, I thought like, why, why cannot one be devoted to Brahman? And you know, it's almost impossible. Everybody says no, no, but I, I don't want to accept defeat. Uh, so. <laughs> well, you just go right on ahead. So, I contemplated and I thought uh, maybe one way to do it is like there is a, a verse in Upanishad called Sarvam Kalidam Brahma. All this is Brahman. So whenever we, and it's about being in the present moment, you know, so you can't be like sitting in a cave and meditating on Brahman whole day, especially in this age. Um, so it, wherever you are, uh, you know, whether you are with your son, daughter, parents, friends, whatever <laughs> nature, at that time, saying Sarvam Kalvedam Brahman and realizing that, yeah, this is Brahman. What is the Brahman that is reflecting through this and being dedicated, uh, devoted to that that particular feeling? Maybe that's one way. I don't know. I'm still exploring. But I, is it impossible for somebody to be devoted to Brahman in this no, way? No, no. It, it's not impossible, but it's very difficult. So we see it as, as, uh, as reflected. As you just said, we see it as reflected in loved ones and so on. I highly recommend for anyone who's interested in this particular aspect of how am I devoted to this nameless, formless divine to read Yagnavalkya's long dissertation to his wife Maitreyi in the Brihadranyaka Upanishad. And he speaks, he starts off by, she asks him, what is it that you know that 
it, it will be more uh, beneficial to me than the the possessions you're leaving me with as you as you go off to uh, be a uh, a uh, a forest dweller and he said all right and he gives starts off by saying it is not for the sake of the wife that the husband loves the wife it is for the sake of the self it is not for the sake of the husband that the wife loves the husband. It is for the sake of the self, capital S, self. And of course, this is the, the language gesture toward that nameless, formless, that is resident in each and every aspect of creation. And his dissertation goes on for some pages as he enumerates trying to convince our left mind that he's including everything in this. So I highly recommend that this is how to be devoted to Brahman. <clears throat> and of course, the, the Advaitists, they are devoted to Brahman, but it's not in any personal sense. It's in the sense, and they often the, the way they do manage, because it, our, our hearts and our minds do this, they most often find any personalization in the person of their guru. <clears throat> uh, now, Ramana Maharshi had no living guru. Shiva was his guru, but he was very devoted to Shiva. And uh, that's why he wanted to live at that uh, particular hill, Arunachala, Arunachala Hill, because he saw that as an actual embodiment, an actual manifestation of Shiva. But if you read Nisargadatta Maharaj, again, his devotion, uh, to the extent that there is devotion, it is to his guru. And, uh, and this is, of course, uh, Adi Shankaracharya. Uh, the great teacher of Advaita was extremely devoted to his uh, teacher Gaurapada, and uh, I mean he he wrote a great long hymn to Gaurapada. So this is this is the devotion of the Advaitist normally, it's as we understand it. So thank you, as always, Gaurapada. Anything else from anyone? All right. I'm going to read one last little piece. This, those of you who grew up in the Judeo-Christian communities uh, will recognize this. It's an oft-quoted prayer. It is the Psalm of David, Psalm 23, the 23rd Psalm. And it goes like this. And this is, this is clearly the speaking of a soul who has achieved realization uh, as a devotee. The 23rd Psalm goes like this. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. <clears throat> he leadeth me in the path, the paths. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. 
The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So this is the, this is the testimony, this is the hymn, the psalm of a great devotee, a realized soul. I mean, there is <laughs> plenty of evidence uh, that uh, David was a realized soul. This is just one. So anything to say in response to <clears throat> what was in the 23rd Psalm? Um, bro brother, can I say, like, uh, it resonates exactly with the poem from the, from, uh, What's his name? Thomas Merton. Yes, Thomas Merton. Exactly. Well, I said we'd hear an echo of what he said. He was actually a paraphrasing in, in that poem. He was paraphrasing from the 23rd Psalm. As some yeah. of those lines are, are very close to a direct quote. And, uh, I, and, and coincidentally, again, nothing happens with coincidence, brother. I, I chanced upon the poem from Walt Whitman, A Watch Ship Puzzled at Sea. <laughs> leaves of grass. I don't know how things happen. I mean, this is yeah. I'm well, just starting to leave. Said, by 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 the mother's grace is what the master says. <laughs> Mr. Ramakrishna says <laughs> it is simply the mother's grace. Seek and Jesus said it too. Seek and yes. you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. If you ask your father for bread, will he give you a stone? If you ask for a fish, will he give you a serpent? No. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all else shall be added unto you, all wisdom and righteousness. And the thing that Jesus taught, you won't find it in the canonical Gospels, because yes. that was the basis for a state religion, and everything else was declared a heresy. But if you look in the other Gospels, particularly the Gospel of Thomas, T.H., O-M-S, O-M-A-S, the Gospel of Thomas, and the Gospel of the Beloved Companion, Mary Magdalene. You'll find this, this all three of these paths, the non-dual, the qualified non-dual, and the uh, dualistic. And they're all valid paths. Why are they seen as valid paths? Vivekananda says the test of validity of a path is does it produce saints <clears throat> and every one of those paths have produced great saints uh, i think everybody would like to uh, have the poem to read the thomas merton one um, so am i uh, can i send it to you and your email or something well, by, by all means do uh Okay, I'll and I'll I'll make sure that it's included uh, with the notes for the talk. Okay, I'll do that. It'll be up with the notes uh, for the talk, which I said, uh, it, it, unless something untoward happens, uh, the the notes for the talk uh, and the talk itself, uh, that, that is to say, this open forum, all of our conversation will be up uh, by Wednesday. So you'll be able to download it all. Anything that uh, is in the way of notes will be downloadable as a PDF, which will include this Thomas Burton poem. And thank you, Guru. Thank anything, you, brother. Anything else?
All right, tears. Brother, would you like me to read the Walt Whitman poem that I just came across? No, dear, not now. Okay. If, you, if you wish to include it too. Uh, okay. I, know, I know the poem you're t speaking of, Leaves of Grass, Leaves of Grass, for those of you who don't know, Walt Whitman. Uh, and then who, uh, what ship puzzled at sea is the one. Yeah. Oh, <clears throat> uh, Swami Vivekananda referred to Walt Whitman as the American sannyasin. He was a great admirer of Walt Whitman and his work. They never met, unfortunately. But uh, that would have been quite a meeting. Uh, but uh, he referred to uh, Walt Whitman as the American sannyasin and was a great admirer of his book, Leaves of Grass, and his other writings. Uh, but Leaves of Grass is his magnum opus. Any final thought from anyone else? Well, thank you all, those of you who have contributed by sharing, and those of you who have not shared. It's always noted that because there is one, only one, though it seems to us that there are many, there is one, only one. And so whatever it is that you're feeling, whatever it is that you are experiencing, we are experiencing it with you whether we have it in our waking awareness or not, it is there as what is called a samskara, a mental impression. And it has a profound effect on us because this is indeed holy company. So thanks to all of you, those of you who spoke and shared, and those of you who were silent and were sharing with us yourself and the experience of what others were saying. Anything else at all, dears? All right. Our closing prayer, this ancient prayer is translated for us by Swami Yogeshananda. Let there be peace in outer space. Let there be peace in the sky, on the earth, and in the waters. Let there be peace in the herbs, the plants, and the trees. May the gods be peaceful. May the whole universe be pervaded by peace. Let that infinite universal peace prevail throughout my being. Om Shanti, 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 peace, peace, peace and beneficence be unto us and to all beloved beings everywhere. Jai Shri Guru Maharaj Ji Ki Jai, Durga, Durga, Durga. May we be safe, may we be healthy, May we be cheerful, may we have peace of mind, and may we be always in the loving and protective embrace of the divine being as our mother and father. So that's it from here. That's it for this Sunday, unless anyone else has any final thing they'd like to, to add. Well, I think Lori wasn't with us because she always has a sweet word to say at the end. I think she's up in Massachusetts with her family. Uh, so uh, I'll, I'll say it for her. Thank you so much. All right, dear. Then that's just how she says it. <laughs> what a good ear. All right. Thank you so much. And she doesn't mean, she means to us all. Thank yes. you so much to us all. She really deeply receives what uh, is offered by everyone. Uh, I'll let her know we missed her. Dear ones, until next time, which would be Tuesday evening, if you care to join us for the discussion of 
<clears throat> the very end, the reading and discussion of the very end of Holy Mother's life, Sri Sharda Devi's life. That's where we are in that wonderful book by Swami Chetanananda, uh, Holy Mother, Sri Sharda Devi, her divine play. So, Arrivederci, Sayanara. And Thank away, you so much. And away we go.